What up, y'all? We are live. It's Sunday, so we are live. What's up? How's it going? How's, how, how's everybody, everybody doing? Sunday. So it's Sunday, so you know what it is, right? It's pre-med. Problems. Solved, y'all. We solving problems tonight. Welcome, welcome. This is live. This is your first time getting at me. Dr. Andrew Pinesett here, the pre-med productivity expert. Good evening, Mark. Submit your guys' questions right now. Let's set the topic for the day. So as you guys remember, we were doing pre-med Q&A where you guys could ask a bunch of random questions. I listen to feedback, right? I'm constantly improving. I live that message of telling you guys, right, getting better every day. I do the same. So with these streams, some of the feedback you guys gave me was, man, there's all this great information in every single stream, but I can't find the topic I want, the question I want, because it's all mixed together based on the random questions that come. So what we're doing now is the first questions will set the theme for the session. And then after that, I want everyone to focus on asking questions related to that topic. That way, when we create these streams, you can go and access a particular stream for a particular topic that you want to get better at. All right. So Hub, what is up? Vic, hello. Good evening. Can everybody see my face? Can everybody see my face? Do, can you see the bags under my eyes? Does it look? Okay, we're okay. We're all right. I just got about three hours of sleep today. I was up all last night. It, it's doctor life, guys. So call shifts can be variable. Last night's call shift was a beast. 24 hours straight of just shenanigans, doing pregnant lady stuff. And if anybody's ever been around a pregnant lady, they're not the most agreeable person. They have are very particular about what they want. <laughs> so it was a very interesting night. But I'm excited to be here with you guys. So what is our topic today? What do you guys want to talk about? What do you need help with? What problem do you need solved? Yes, Kyle. Three teams in a row. So I've emerged from the cocoon, guys. My new course, How to Dominate Pre-Med, The Definitive Guide, is done. It is done. It's a wrap. It's on my website. It is the bomb. It is pre-med, literally A to Z. Everything, like the whole kitchen sink, is in that course. It almost killed me making it, but it's done. So now I have emerged, we can live stream again. <laughs> so Vic is the first person to go out there and give me a question or a topic. Could you possibly go into depth about different fields within medicine, i.e. medicine, PA, dentistry, nursing, pharmacy, etc.? Actually, I think that's actually a really good topic. I think that's a really, really good topic. Uh, so we'll do that. We'll do different, different careers in medicine and talk about them and the pros and the cons and what each one means. You guys think it's a good topic? That's a good topic. Give me a like or a heart or something right now. Uh, let me know you guys like that topic. You guys want to talk about, should I be a PA? Should I be a doctor? Should I be a nurse? Should I be a dentist? Should I really be smart and be an orthodontist? Right? What should I do? And because see, my Black Friday was wonderful because I spent zero dollars. I didn't go out and buy a DVD player or something I wouldn't be using. I actually went and I took advantage of, which is kind of funny, Barnes & Noble had an online Black Friday sale. I took advantage of that and ordered some online books from Barnes & Noble. That's what I did with my, my Black Friday. So it was good. So Esteban says, how do you deal with uh, death as a physician? Uh, also, how do you help patients? So we can talk about that. That's fine. Uh, all right. So we'll do that. So we'll talk about, and we'll talk about DO, right? And so even though the stigma of DO is disappearing, how long before? And actually, I disagree with that. So I think it's a really good topic. So tonight, we're going to talk about MD versus DO. We'll do that later. But first, we'll do MD versus PA versus NP versus nurse versus, well, actually, we'll, we'll diverge, versus dentist versus optometrist. I think it's all of them, versus orthodontist. Is that enough topics? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm excited to have you guys on here with me on Facebook, live stream. MD versus DO. We'll get to that in a second. So this is B2. We'll start here. So I think it's important, and I talked about this, I did a YouTube live stream. Uh, last night, one of the rare YouTube live streams, and I talked about the number one thing I wish I knew as a pre-med, going to be a doctor. And the biggest, I think, drawback to being a physician 
I think is also the biggest benefit. <laughs> As a medical doctor, you are the person who carries all the responsibility for the team. So all of these providers practice underneath a physician. So when they do something, when they do something, it gets assigned to a physician. And at the end of the day, if something happens, the buck stops with the physician. So they get all the responsibility. Now, that's a cool thing about being a doctor is that you are the responsible party. So if you want to be fully in charge of a patient's care from A to Z, and this is something I was talking about with a pharmacy a student who wants to switch from pharmacy to medical school, is that they were like, man, I just, I feel like I'm so locked into whatever the doctor orders. I feel like I'm so locked in to all these things and I can't really affect change for the patient's health upstream. And so they want to go now to medical school. And for you guys, um, when we're talking about the benefits of being a doctor, it's if you're a person who wants all that responsibility. If you want to be the primary person in charge of a patient's care and driving all the care, that's the physician, right? If you like the stress and the pressure of not having anyone you can lean on, because all these others can go to the doctor and say, hey, listen, this is what I was thinking, but what do you think? And in a way, they function as resident plus, right? So they're, they're like residents in the sense that they have to check what they're attending. So as an anesthesia resident, right, I have cases tomorrow. I looked at my cases um, a little bit before this, I'm going to finish looking them up tonight, make sure the patients are healthy and think about a plan of what I want to do. But I still have the attending physician to say, hey, this is what I think I was going to do. What do you think about that? And they can, you know, tweak the plan to make it perfect. And so as a medical doctor, you're the person, you're the final person, you're the plan. But as all these other providers, you can always look to the physician for additional support. So as a doctor, lots of responsibility. The flip side of that is what I talked about in my video yesterday about the number one thing I wish I knew about going into being a doctor, and it's the loss of freedom. And why do you have such limited freedom in terms of hours and, and all these things? It's because you're the responsible person. When everybody else punches out because their shift is over, you can't because you're responsible. At the end of the day, if it doesn't get done, the patient doesn't get cared for, it's you. And so that responsibility leads to a lot of extra responsibilities in terms of administrative things, paperwork, looking after people, all these extra hoops you have to jump through to do your job that these other specialties don't have. And so I think that's one of the biggest benefits of doing one of these other ones is that you don't have the headache <laughs> of all that extra responsibility. As a PA, you do your exact one role. I'm doing this. So I'm a PA specializing in blank. And you do exactly that, nothing more. You don't have to do the extras, all the things. You're out when your time is over, your time is over, you're done. You tend to not have call if you're a PA or NP. Most of these positions you can negotiate not having to work overnight. So a lot of, like for example, our nurse practitioners, even our ICU, we have critical care nurse practitioners and they work in the ICU. Just like a resident would, they take care of patients that are very sick, critically ill, making excellent clinical decisions, right? But they're able to negotiate because they're nurses and they're a nurses union that they don't work overnight. So our nurse practitioners work three, four days a week and they only work daytime. So they work three 12s, four 12s, and that's their whole week. So that's nice compared to, I just got off a 27 hour shift, right? So that's the difference is their hours tend to be a lot nicer. So if you're someone who's looking for a family, these offer nice practice opportunities for family. The other part of that is if you're someone who, right, who wants that work-life balance, that all these things are you need the money urgently or you wanna get through the process, the training for all these is much shorter and more direct. And therefore, you're not languishing in your undergrad and bachelor's, your medical school, then your residency, then your fellowship to finally get out, make a job, set your own hours and make money. You can do all that stuff much faster with these careers. So people, I think a lot of times get hung up and they're like, oh, I want the MD. I don't want to be a PA because of the stigma of it. But as I keep talking to you guys about, I don't care what other people have to say. I don't care what other people think. I don't care about stigmas. I care about doing what's right for me. Right, for my non-traditional students. I don't care that I'm non-traditional. I don't care that other people want to stigmatize me and tell me that, hey, because I have kids, I can't make the journey. I don't care that people say, listen, if I have a jacked up undergrad GPA that I can't improve. I don't care what they say. I care about what I can do and what it matters to me and what's a fit for me. And there's nothing wrong and don't let people make you feel bad because, oh, I'm settling for a PA. I'm settling going to nursing school. I'm settling being an NP. Because maybe that's the route for you. And it's not settling, it's upgrading to match what your expectations are of a career and of training to get where you want to be. And that's happiness, right? Because at the end of the day, you got one life, so be happy with it. Pick the career 
that you care about, not that your parents care about, not that your friends care about, not that you think society cares about. What do you actually care about? So pick your right career. I think that would be the biggest delineation. Then in terms of what specifically these do and what the roles are that are different, <clears throat> for a PA and an NP, they're essentially the same thing except for their route of training. So a PA is trained to think more like a physician, whereas a nurse practitioner is trained as a nurse, and then once she's a nurse and learns nurse skills and nurse thinking, then says, you know what, and this is what nurses do, right? So nurses are an integral part of the team, and I actually couldn't be a nurse because they do so much. It's like, it'd be overload for me. They're so integral to everything that happens on the team. But the nurses do a lot of the tasks that the physicians assign. So then what a nurse might want to do is say, listen, I like doing all this stuff, but I want to be more in charge of the actual care. And so they get an additional degree as a nurse practitioner. That way, right, they're a, a practicing medicine person, right? And they can make clinical decisions. And that bumps them up to be like a PA. So if these two can make clinical decisions, this person executes clinical decisions. However, over time, right, nurses develop clinical expertise that is super helpful to physicians. I lean on nurses all the time and say, listen, hey, you've probably seen this, you've been here 40 years, what do you think of the situation? Should I do this? And they'll be like, ah, in the past I haven't seen physicians do that, I wouldn't advise that. I'm like, okay, great, we're on the same page. So that's the difference is making clinical decisions, executing clinical decisions. Does that make sense everybody? And the pay is, depending on what you choose here, is higher. If you're primary care, it's not actually that much higher than these. It's comparable. Um, as an MP, you can make more than a primary care uh, medical doctor, depending on what you specialize in. So, like I said, our critical care nurse practitioners make a ton. We have nurse practitioners who go in the operating room and do uh, surgeries, assisting surgeons. They make a ton. We have PAs that do that. They make a ton. So, if you're worried about money, it can end up being either one of these, depending on your specialty. It really depends. And even in anesthesia, right? I'm a medical doctor, anesthesiologist. But as you guys know, there's a thing called a nurse anesthetist. So this is a trained nurse who then gets extra certification. Instead of being a nurse practitioner, she becomes a nurse anesthetist, and then she can do anesthesia like a resident anesthesiologist, so under the supervision of a licensed anesthesiologist. There's also now, and this is no joke, guys, this is the underground, like, hidden tip career you should get into in healthcare, is anesthesia assistant. So what this is, is this is someone who has a bachelor's degree in whatever thing, has clinical experience. So for you guys who who wanted to be an anesthesiologist, didn't actually get into medical school, this might be a great route for you. Because these anesthesia assistant programs are master's programs where all you do for a couple of years is train in anesthesia. You skip medical school, you skip all the real complex stuff, and you get right to the procedures of anesthesia. And then as an anesthesia assistant, you deliver anesthesia care, just like a nurse anesthetist, under the supervision of a medical doctor, and starting salaries are in the high $100,000. So it's greater than $100,000 working four days a week, three days a week, doing shift work, working underneath someone else's license. You don't have to pre-op, you don't have to patients. It's a great career. So I highly recommend that as a little underground something there. Um, in all these areas as I mentioned, right, we have critical care, we have surgery, we have critical care, we have surgery, we have derm, we have ortho. So don't think, people think that PAs and nurse practitioners have to be general, generalists, but they can actually specialize and a variety of specialties with additional either training or on the job training. So they just start working in a specialty, get experience in it, and that becomes their focus in their area. And so you can specialize in these areas. Um, yes, so I think I delineate that. Responsibility, independence, overall, the final word in clinical decision making, clinical, clinical decision making capabilities, clinical execution capabilities. Money can vary amongst those. I know nurses that make a lot of money, but they work a lot for it, right? And these specialties, depending on what specialty is, you can make a lot of money. Um, when we talk about, and then we're going to talk about MD versus DO in a second. I saw someone just comment that, MD versus DO. We'll talk about it. Uh, and Oh, actually, that's a good topic for Canadian students, and we'll talk about that, too. Are you guys liking this? Give me a like. Give me a comment right now. Let me know you guys are with me, and you guys are enjoying this. Let me know. Let me know. If you let me, let me know. Should I stay or should I go? If you something, let me know. Should I stay or should I go? I think I should have been a singer, guys. I think I missed my calling. Like, doctoring is cool, 
But could you imagine me rocking the mic? I mean, if Little Yachty can have an album, if Migos can have an album, I can mumble. <laughs> Masked off. That's Future. I just, I literally just sang Future song right there. <laughs> Masked off. That's the only word you know. And you'd be in the club like, yeah, mass off, mass off, what up? Jubin, what's going on? Right? That's what you guys do. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. What happened to my rap, guys? Anyway. <laughs> All right, so we're on track. So everybody understands MDPA, MP, nurse. Now, this is something you guys comment a lot on. So, again, these are live streams, right? So we're doing this. It's meant to get you guys wisdom and advice that's truthful but it's not all encompassing. So of course, there are nuances to all this stuff. But what we're trying to give you guys is a general sense of what to work with. I can't do everything there is to know about each of these specialties in a YouTube or Facebook video. But we're getting, I think, great sound advice. I think you guys feel that way. So let's keep it going. Jessel, what's up? So, MD versus dentist. So should you be a doctor or a dentist? Depends. <laughs> So I could never be a dentist because I would hate to be in the mouth all day. I think that's really, really strange to me. The other thing, I think dentistry is kind of a crock because I have no pain when I go in. I always leave with pain. I don't understand that. But dentistry is a good career in the sense that the reason medical careers are kind of in the tank and kind of stinky right now is because of all the stuff you're hearing about around healthcare, insurance, and reimbursement, and the uninsured. And currently, right, what is Trump doing? He's increasing the number of uninsured people. He's increasing the power and the leverage of insurance companies. And he's diminishing the power of hospitals and physicians to protect themselves. As a result, right, the way insurance companies work is they get all the money up front. All the money up front. So if I'm the insurance company, I got all your monies. Then as a hospital and as a doctor and as a patient, you have to come beg me, the insurance company, to pay for care. Hey, listen, I need my legs sewn back on. Will you pay for it? Ah, uh, we'll think you'd be fine with one leg. We're going to let that leg go. It's not covered under your policy, right? That's what insurance companies do. And the reason they do that is because they have all the incentive not to pay for things because they have all the money. I have all the money. I don't need to pay for a service. I've got the money already. So the problem is, is when you have insurance in general, that's a problem. But when you have high numbers of uninsured people, what hospitals do to stay afloat is they offset the cost of care onto people who are insured. So if you're insured, the reason your premium goes up is because there are people who are uninsured who are going up. And so to cover everybody's care and not go out of business, they raise your premiums, they charge you more for services to account for the people they know are going to come in and they can't pay for their services. So it's, it's an offset cost, right? It's distributing the cost of goods across everybody. So the problem with that is that then physicians have to scrounge and hospitals have to scrounge for nickels to get paid. So they get paid nickels on the dollar of their service. The advantage of dentists, optometrists, and orthodontists is that they don't, their services are pre-approved. So everyone knows, right, you go to the dentist, you go to orthodontist, you go to optometrist. What happens? You walk in there and before you even see the dentist or anybody, the person at the front desk, they run your insurance. And they say, listen, today we're going to do this, this, and this. We're going to run it by your insurance to see if it's going to get done. If the insurance says no, you can't go back and get the service. <laughs> so it's you get it, they're guaranteed the money up front. Whereas MDs, we do the service and then we ask for the money on the back and we get screwed. Here, they ask for the money up front, they get the money. As a result, their reimbursement is higher. So for every dollar of care a dentist provides, he'll get more of that dollar's worth of reimbursement from insurance than a medical doctor will. As a result, what happens? A dentist can work 40 hours a week and make a good amount of money. Whereas an MD works, right, on average, 50-something hours a week because they have to cover for the cost that's lost in insurance reimbursement. So that's one positive thing. The other positive thing is that these services are cheaper, and therefore a lot of people can afford to supplement and offset what insurance won't pay with cash payments. So if you go to the dentist, right, they give you the option. Hey, listen, your insurance will cover this type of silver filling. But if you want that white enamel, right, to match your teeth, then you can pay an extra 200 bucks and we'll match your teeth enamel. In healthcare, you can't do that. You can't say, oh, listen, your insurance will cover us replacing your knee with this joint, but you can get this fancy new knee joint and you can just supplement it with $80,000. Why? Because no one has $80,000 for a new joint laying around, but you can afford 200 bucks for the enamel. So the reimbursement is much higher in these specialties 
per what you work, but at the same time, teeth, glasses, not even eyeballs, glasses, and then this is braces. And I think orthodontry, uh, orthodontry is actually kind of sick because even there, you're not really, all you're doing is putting braces on, looking at the braces, oh, they're still there, putting it like, right? They don't really do a whole lot. So I think orthodontist is kind of a cool specialty. And their reimbursement is even higher than dentistry. Uh, but dentists, right, their suicide rate is super high because, right, people's teeth, that's rough all day. But anyway, dentists, optometrists. Why, also, on a side note, why does the dentist always try to talk to you when they have the tools in your mouth? Oh, yeah, everything's good. My friend, we're not. Like, you see, I, I know you want to make small talk and make everything feel comfortable, but I have tools in my mouth. Maybe we should save that until after you save my teeth, right? Maybe that's what's causing me the pain is you guys are working on my teeth, moving target while you're trying to talk to me. Let's wait till afterward. But anyway, all right. Everybody see that? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? These are outpatient office jobs with set hours, daytime hours, nothing truly critical versus here, critical, inpatient, call, all sorts of things. You can work outpatient here and it's similar, but you're still going to work more hours per clinic. So if you're a primary care physician working in a clinic, you're still going to work more hours than you would if you were in these specialties. The bad side is, is these tend to be independent practices, so you have to actually have business sense or people around you who know business who can manage the money for you and help you not go out of business by buying expensive uh, tools that you can't afford based on what you're charging for your services. Care differences, money differences, and practice structure differences. That's what I would say are those big categories. If everybody liked that, let me know right now. Comment in the box. Let me know we're on track, that you guys are liking what we're talking about, that you guys like this. This is a good session. This is your guys' pick. You guys set the topic. Vic says it makes sense. Is this making sense to you guys right now? Like, 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 comment, comment, comment right now. Let me know you guys like this. And we'll continue. We'll do MD versus DO. Especially important for Canadian students. <clears throat> what do we think? Oh, am I lagging, Kenyon? I'm sorry, I'm lagging. My reception is terrible. For some reason, I did the new update on my iPhone. So I'm on my iPhone right now. I did the new update, and I don't know about you guys, but I think my phone, I think it was a ploy to get me to update to that that new fancy iPhone 8 or iPhone 10, because my phone has been so glitchy and slow lately. I'm like, good, well played, Apple, well played. Oh, we got this new fancy update. We got this new fancy update, and then my phone is garbage now. So I appreciate that. Send that comment to Apple. Let them know that, you, you know, we're going to kill it on our live streams right here. Let them know. Sabrina, what up? All right, so everybody's liking this. MBDO, especially for Canadian students. So... Actually, you know what, you guys, give me, give me two seconds. Let me grab a drink of water because, I, I, like I said, I haven't slept. I'm, like, sick. My whole family's sick. So I'm going to grab a drink of water. Give me literally ten seconds to grab a drink of water. i got to run it by you guys. I'll be back in two seconds. All right, we're back. My bad, guys. So, also, while I'm getting this water, the, have you guys seen Crystal Geyser has gone to these bottles that are like little kids' cups? It reminds me of my kids' cup. The, the, the cap doesn't come off. You just pop it back like you're an infant, and you drink from it. Hopefully that looked better than Donald Trump drinking last week. Hopefully this, like, what was he doing? Like, two-hand, I don't know, looks like some old people type stuff. All right. I guess no one looks cool drinking water. <laughs> right? Like, oh man, looks so cool drinking water. All right, MDDO, especially for Canadian students. So there's been a lot made about DOs being more legitimate now because the residencies are merging. But here's the truth, guys. Here's the truth. Are you guys ready? I think now is actually the worst time to go to a DO school. And this is just my opinion. You can do whatever you want, listen to everybody else, do whatever. But I think, thank you, I, I feel that, Ju, and I feel like I look very sexy drinking that water. Sexy, what, like a model, right? Like, ooh, does he work for Crystal Geyser? Is this a campaign head? Yes, it is. Product placement. 
Get your crystal geyser today. You could look that sexy drinking water. Anyway, in vivo should DO. So I think this is actually the worst time to apply to DO schools. And this is debatable, but this is just me reading between the lines and extrapolating out a historical trend in the way things are in terms of mentalities towards DO and what's happening to residencies in this merger. So if you guys don't know, DO resident, so MD, the way people are reading it, right, because they're not understanding the specifics, is they're saying that MD and DO residencies are merging into one. So there will be no separate MD versus DO residencies because they are combining to make super residencies. However, what's actually happening is that DO residencies don't have the funding to support, right, the funding or the practice sizes to support a lot of separate residencies. So if you've looked back at DO residencies in the past, they've been very specific to certain areas, to certain specialties, and especially certain specialties, they've been higher numbers because that's what they can support. So there haven't been a lot of DO surgery or anesthesia residencies, as an example, because they're more expensive programs to run and the funding and the staff support isn't there. Does everybody understand what I'm saying there? So DO residencies in the past have been limited to a certain number of specialties and smaller numbers in certain areas because of funding. Because of that, DO residencies are like, eh, we don't know if it's worth it to do this. We should instead focus on getting our students into MD residencies. So instead of having them take separate tests and do different things, and we're going to start training them for MD residencies and then push them into MD residencies. So now what's happening is you had two pools You had two pools of residencies. All the MD students applied to MD residencies. DO students applied to both. This was a smaller pool, but if you couldn't get into this MD residency pool, you still had this to fall back on. Does that make sense to everybody? And the reason you needed this pool to fall back on is because a lot of MD residency programs and specialties won't take DOs. And I was literally, we were in, we were in a C-section last night. That's why it was perfect this topic came up. We were in a C-section last night, and we were talking about a story where at UCSD, right? So UC uh, San Diego, it's a major medical hub for residency training. It's in San Diego. They've got baller facilities. People come from all over the world to get treatment there. So it's great training. Everyone wants to be at UCSD. A lot of people do. UCSD, the only residency program that will take DOs at UCSD on a consistent basis is family medicine. Internal medicine sometimes will take a DO. Outside of that, you cannot be a DO and go to residency at UCSD. Anesthesia can't do it. OB, they were saying last night, they had someone who was begging as a medical student, a DO medical student, to come do an away rotation. Away rotations function as auditions or extended interviews for residency programs. And UCSD would not allow this person to come and do a rotation because they said, we will not consider you for our residency because you're a DO. Anesthesia at UCSD, same premise. Surgery, plastics, derm, they're not taking DOs. And so by going to a DO school in the past, you had this pool to fall back on to, oh, if they don't want me, I can still go DO in this specialty. And so it gives you more opportunities to match in a residency. So that's why DO's residency match numbers are not bad. And that's why I always recommend Caribbean or DO schools over Caribbean schools. Now what's happening is you're losing this pool of residencies. So now DO's are going to have to go head up with MD students into MD programs. And what's happened is MD programs have said, hey, listen, yeah, go ahead and dissolve your DO residencies. We will no longer discriminate as much against your DO students. We will start treating them more like MD students and giving them serious consideration for our programs. But if you look at who's in charge of these programs, it's still the same people who have been biased against DO students for a long, long time. Therefore, do you really expect them to all of a sudden make this shift and truly consider DOs on the same plane as medical students, as uh, MD students? Do you guys see what I'm saying? The same people making decisions. It'd be like, for example, Trump, who can't stand minorities, right, who has traditionally discriminated against this group, right, and said, hey, listen, all those darkies are killing our country. 
Now all of a sudden he's saying, listen, <laughs> you don't need any other things. Make me your leader, dark people, and I'll look at you the same as not dark people. Trump, rich people, poor people. Oh, don't worry, poor people. I really do like you. Come on over here, poor people. I won't discriminate against you. It's not logical. So what I think is that DOs are going to run into a harder time. Their match numbers are going to go down, I think. And this is just all extrapolation off right, reading the signs of, of what's been happening and establishing a historical trend. That's what I think is going to happen. At the same time, if you had a choice, MD, DO, or Caribbean, I would pick DO. Because you'll get a lot more serious considerations at the programs that do accept DOs than these Caribbean students. This is a much harder path in terms of how they look at you. And also, getting there's all these hurdles to get to the, to the actual be able to apply to an MD uh, program. Does everybody understand? MD, DO, that. So who's this? AJ Pinjoy is, is pinning comments. We're not talking about minor and major languages today, AJ. You may, might have been on here late. Today we're only talking about the difference between specialties. So I'm going to unpin your comment. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody there? So I vote MD if you can, then DO, then Caribbean. This doesn't extend to other international medical schools, and particularly to Canadians. So for Canadian students, there are a subset, a small subset of medical schools in America that don't look at you as international students. They look at you just like U.S. Uh, medical students here. So you can go from a Canadian medical school to an MD residency just like one of these students. But it's a small number of schools, right? So again, match number is smaller. There's another subset of schools that look at you as international students but give you more serious consideration than a lot of foreign countries because right, Canadians are our northern neighbor, so they feel more familiar with it, and therefore they're more likely to accept it. right? We, we accept and we like what we know. We don't like the unfamiliar, and so that's more familiar, so they're more likely to accept you. The big problem that Canadian medical students face in going to MD program, going to residencies, is funding. So residencies are federally funded programs, and therefore you have to be able to establish federal funding, and only certain pro programs have federal funding for international students. That's Canadian medical students. So these are Canadian MDs. Now for Canadian undergrad students, so you have not gone to medical school in Canada, you just went to undergrad, you went to college in Canada. You then want to come to an MD med school. Okay? When you pick your med school, DO versus MD, okay, and somebody just asked, what's DO? I apologize. Medical doctor, doctor of osteopathy. They function in the same space clinically, but because of false stigmas, DO is considered in some circles not to be as, um, as good as an MD. And so you get discriminated against by patients and by residency programs. That's what we're talking about now. So if you're Canadian undergrad and you're choosing a medical school, should you do MD or DO? It depends. If you want to go back to Canada, you need to do an MD medical school because Canada does not recognize the DO degrees in America. So if you want to go back to Canada and practice, you have to go to an MD medical school. If you don't care about staying in America, then you can do a DO school, but you run into the same problem here as American DO students. So if you can, you want to do MD first, then DO, and then Caribbean, just like American medical students. It's the same pecking order. But the reason it matters is because you can't go practice as easily with a DO back into uh, Canadian residencies and into Canadian practice. So you need to have that separation there. Um, with these uh, programs, and we'll talk about, actually, I won't get into all of that. Well, I won't get into everything about Canadian uh, applicants, but that's the decision making between Indian DO and Canadian considerations. So U.S. students, this simple. Canadian MDs, you've got to go to these residencies, but you've got to find the ones that will accept you. And then for Canadian undergrads, you've got to go to medical schools. And there's a smaller subset of medical schools that will accept Canadian students because they have to, again, you have to be able to, as an international student, you're not eligible for federal grants, Pell Grants, Cal Grants, all those kind of things. So therefore, the medical school is going to require you to fill out a certificate of financial aid, which shows them that you can actually pay for your education in some way, whether it's 
loans from Canada, or you get a bank loan, you get a personal inheritance, whatever it is, they make you show you have the money to pay for all four years before they'll let you in. And it's only the private schools it tends to be that will accept Canadian undergrad students. So don't apply to public, a whole lot of public schools. You won't uh, be accepted. All righty. Was that good? How, how long have we been on here? I kind of blacked out there on the board. Someone tell me how, how long have we been on here? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm like dying, guys. I think I need a doctor. I'm going to get my sippy cup together. All right. So I hope you guys like this video. Uh, this is what we're going to be doing Sundays at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You guys set the topic. So if there's something that's bugging you all week, come with that topic ready to go. And we'll get on on Sunday and we'll talk about it. We'll go in hard like this. I felt like this was clear. This was concise, right, to the point of giving you guys answers that you need to make these kind of decisions. There's no need to complicate it, shroud it in mystery. Just let's just talk about it and let's get it and let's go. Okay? Every Sunday, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. On Wednesdays, we'll go at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, a topic that I choose. Okay? As always, my website is premanproductivity.com. There's online courses on there where I go into much more depth than this. This is covered extensively in my new course, How to Dominate pre The Definitive Guide. It goes into choosing an undergrad, choosing a college, choosing a residency. All that's covered in that new course for you guys. Today, Black Friday, it's the last day of my Black Friday special. 20% off all courses with the coupon code Black Friday 20 until midnight, and you can get into this course. But in my courses, what we do is we go into much greater depth than what I'm able to go to in a live stream. But we cover it wall to wall, right? So there's all these out there for you. Get over there, premiumproductivity.com, online courses, and also I offer coaching that you have to apply to, right? And go and get that and get the coaching and we can help. And I've been doing coaching sessions and I feel bad. I have to apologize if Eric is watching. I apologize we're supposed to do coaching today. And my, again, doctor, I get my schedule got shipped around. I worked that crazy shift last night and I have been trying to sleep all day, but you guys know how it is. It's hard to today sleep, but to get rest up. But I apologize, Erica, we will reschedule for this week and we'll be back in um, coaching. And then Jesslyn's on here. Jesslyn, we're meeting tomorrow, I believe, um, for a coaching session. Um, yeah. All right. Was that, I, I hope you guys really, really like that. If you like this, please take a, a second and just share this video to your page so your friends can be informed and people can be in the know about what's going on. Take a second, like, subscribe, and subscribe. Click the notifications toggle on my page. That way you can know every time I'm live. And then Mark just asked a question that's related, so we'll talk about it. Patient perception of DO versus MD. Well, let me ask you. What is your, if you're a patient, would you want an MD or a DO? The answer for most people is I want an MD. Why? Because they realize that if you went to a DO school, it's because you didn't get into a medical school nine times out of ten. And so there's a perception that because you couldn't get into medical school, that somehow makes you a more inferior physician if you went to a DO school. I don't necessarily think that because I think people can grow, right? That growth mindset. So even if you weren't a stellar MD candidate, if you get into a DO school, it's a reset button and an opportunity for you to improve yourself, your knowledge, your study skills, all those things and make yourself a super competent physician. And those students who go from DO programs into MD residencies are the people who put the time in, put the effort in to grow, to get better and to become amazing. I've met some astonishing DO physicians. But the general perception is, is that you didn't get into an MD program, therefore you're in fear and that carries on for forever. So you have to change that perception by being ultra professional, ultra qualified, ultra in the know, and right, exceeding their patient care expectations. Alrighty, that is it guys. PremiumProductivity.com, I'm Dr. Andrew Pinesett, the Premium Productivity Expert. Every Sunday guys, be here. There's no reason not to be here for this great information. I thank you guys very much for being here. Happy Thanksgiving again. And I will see you guys on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on my Facebook. Thank you guys.